So we've talked a lot over the last couple of weeks about how different emotions like guilt and envy and anger can really impact our lives. They can get us in trouble when they become the boss of us. They can affect our moods. They can affect our mouths, what we say, and they can affect our relationships. And so today, as the guys have already said, I want to really unpack fear. It's something that Jesus talked a lot about, and it's a really common emotion, isn't it? I mean, I'm sure that all of you in the room and those of you who are watching online with us today have experienced or encountered fear in one way or another across your life. I remember this one time where I experienced fear to the point where I didn't know whether my heart was going to stop beating or beat so fast that it was just going to explode. I, it's quite a few years ago now, but I enrolled in a scuba diving class. I thought it would be a good idea to get my open water license. One of the reasons was that I'm a nature lover and I thought, beautiful, I'm gonna go visit the coral, see this incredible ecosystem underwater. But the main reason that I decided to go and get my open water license was that I was terrified of sharks. I know it doesn't make a lot of sense, but I was like, this is it. I am going to crush this fear. So I don't know why I was afraid of sharks. We grew up a lot at the beach. You know, we were there a lot. I never saw Jaws, so that wasn't the problem. But you do read a lot of stories and newspaper articles, and I think your imagination just takes a hold of it, right? And you sort of anticipate what might happen when you get into the water. So the course is going well. I've done all the basic lessons because you start off in a pool and you actually learn a little bit of sign language. For those of you that have done scuba diving, you know, maybe you know uh, this one. I'm okay. I'm okay. This one. I'm out of water, I'm out of air, it's not doing so good. But they also teach you some really cool sign language for the animals that you're gonna encounter under the water. And so I learned uh, this one, this is whale, and then this makes sense, this is dolphin, like mini whale, right? Kind of makes sense. Anyone got any idea what this would be? Jellyfish, Jellyfish. yep. Absolutely. So I am ready. They say, yep, you are good. You're good to go out for your first open water dive. And so off we head to the broad water, the spit. And our visibility is pretty poor out there. Um, But it's all good because I'm excited and I know my sign language and it's going to be good. So um, (laughs) I've been in the water for a little while and suddenly the instructor looks at me and he does this. Now, for those of you that don't know underwater scuba diving sign language, that means turn around, there's a shark. Well, I turned around (laughs) and there was a shark (laughs) and it was swimming right for us. And cue the theme music for Jaws, because even though I've never seen it, you know the music, right? And so it is pumping through my ears and I'm like... I mean, I think I was sweating. You can't tell when you're underwater, but my heart was like pumping. I was basically unable to move at that point. Like fear, I've never felt so gripped by fear. And then the shark comes a little closer and it's tiny. (laughs) And it swims on by us completely, you know, disinterested in this little group of scuba divers. And I went on to relax and enjoy that dive and enjoy many subsequent dives. But fear, it can sometimes grip you to the point where you are unable to move. And um, it can really stop you in your tracks. And maybe you don't have a fear like I did about sharks, but I'm sure that all of you have experienced in your lives at some point that kind of fear that just stops you in your tracks. None of us want fear or anxiety or worry to be the boss of us, do we? Like, it's not what we want. But sometimes a little bit of fear can actually be a good thing. It can actually uh, protect us from harm and keep us from making reckless and stupid decisions. And so a little bit of fear is good. But on the other hand, living with too much fear can cause us to be self-absorbed and it can cause us to be distracted and overly protective. And for some of you, fear is not the boss of you and perhaps 
the friends and family in your life are thinking you could do with a little bit more fear when you approach some of those activities that you like to uh, involve yourselves in. But for most people, there is an element of fear that can creep into our lives when we get in certain situations or, um, you know, just certain parts of our lives that can really put us off balance. And for others of us, it does more than just creep in. It actually is crippling. And it can really affect your day-to-day lives. It's, um, it's something that can interfere with our relationships and it can keep us awake at night, sometimes that level of fear. The interesting thing about fear, though, is that it's actually the byproduct of something really good. And it's something that we would not want to give up, even if we had the opportunity to do so. See, fear is the byproduct of our ability to accumulate knowledge and project into the future. So exhibit A, fear of sharks, I've accumulated knowledge. I've read some news articles, I've maybe watched a movie or not, um, and I've projected that into the future and imagined what it could look like for me to be attacked by a shark. But the ability to collect and to add on to that knowledge and project into the future, it's actually one of God's greatest gifts to us because that same ability is the very thing that allows us to get excited and to look forward to something and to hope and to anticipate. And so it's a great gift, but it also brings with us, brings with it the ability to fear and the potential to fear. And that's because of two little words that can really stop us in our tracks. Do you know what those words are? What if? What if? (laughs) Wow, go Pauline. (laughs) It's an endless question when you get stuck down the what if track. It's the voice of fear. Your imagination can take over and your what ifs pile up to the point where you decide that the risk is too high and the stakes are too great. And so you are basically you know, trapped in that fear and fear overtakes the courage that you have to step out in faith. Jesus actually had a lot to say about fear. And when you read through, um, well, actually, let's, let's go even back a little bit. To sum up Jesus, before we even reach the Bible, let me just sum up Jesus' teachings on fear for you because it was pretty simple. His bottom line, if, if you had to ask him, was pretty simple. Fear not. That's it. <laughs> Don't fear just stop it, (laughs) fear not, quit it, stop being afraid. Or to use the title of this series, don't let fear be the boss of you. Easy to say, much harder to live out. And Jesus' followers in the first century actually found um, they felt the same way. They believed him, fear not, do not be afraid. But how did that look like lived out? You know, what did that actually, how do you actually do that? And so what I want to do this morning is to take a journey through some of the stories that we read about in the book of Matthew, some of Jesus' teachings that were actually recorded by the apostles. They were there. They were first-hand witnesses. They were the bystanders and saw it all firsthand. And we're going to have a look at what Jesus had to say about the topic of fear. And so for context, I thought we could start by just looking at one of the spaces where God, where Jesus actually says, don't fear. So he's chosen his 12 apostles. He's got them all there together. He's gathered them and he's kind of giving them the big picture of what's ahead. And he basically, he says this. He says, I am sending you out like sheep amongst wolves. And they go, okay, they don't live like we do. They lived back in the time where they actually understood that that was more than just a little bit of nice poetic language. They were like, we've seen this. We've seen what happens when sheep and wolves are in the same paddock and it does not end well for the sheep. So Jesus saying, you're the sheep. (laughs) I'm sending you out like sheep amongst wolves. You'll be arrested and beaten. Don't be afraid. (laughs) And (laughs) I wonder... If they wondered, you know, have we missed something here? Because these previous sentences kind of give us reason to be very afraid. And, you know, have we missed the how, the how-to? But Jesus, and when we read through um, all of the, the books of the New Covenant, we discover that his, his teaching was so purposeful. It was so purposeful and 
rather than just sort of these isolated events, you can actually see that they're all connected together and, and that Jesus was so intentional with, with how he taught and, and what words he used. And so I want to, uh, and that's why it's actually so important that we do our devotions and we're opening the Word of God and we're reading through things um, like we do daily because we're not just taking um, isolated verses out of context. It's not just, uh, we're reading it through and we're understanding the context and how it all works together. So I want to share a uh, story for this morning and it's one that you're all really familiar with. But instead of thinking about it like an isolated event, like we often do when we open the Scripture, I want, to, I want you to think about it as a really purposeful teaching moment, an excursion. Like Jesus is taking his disciples on a school excursion. Remember how good they were? Some of you are like, I don't know, it was a while back. Um, but they were good. It was like when you would learn what you've learned in the classroom and you go out to the real world and you actually apply it. Like, you know, when you got to go to dream world with your year 11 physics class, because that's where you really learnt about energy and motion and inertia. Like that was the highlight of my year 11 physics class. Anyone with me? Putting it into, into the real world. And so Jesus is taking his disciples on an excursion and he wants to teach them about fear. So we're going to pick up in Matthew where he records the story. So it's Matthew chapter 8 and we're going to start at verse 23. Then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Suddenly, a furious storm came up on the lake. Now, for them to use the word furious, I'm thinking it must have been a big storm because these guys were used to the storms. They were used to the Sea of Galilee that often had bad weather. But it must have been not just a gentle wind and a gentle little you know, storm for him to actually use that language. So it was furious. And the waves swept over the boat. Picture the boats that were being used back then. They were not massive, big ships. These were little, wooden, open crafts. So these guys are in the middle of a lake. It is pouring. It is windy. The rain is pelting down. They cannot see the land behind them or before them because it's cloudy and the rain is coming down so hard. And there's no, like, little nice undercover air-conditioned section. Like, they are getting wet. They are dripping wet and it is loud because the wind is howling. So what does Matthew tell us next? Jesus was sleeping in an open boat getting pelted by rain and wind and he is sleeping. How in the world? But we'll continue. The disciples went and woke him saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. And he replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? And they're like, what? We can't hear you. And, he's, and at this stage, he's still lying down. He hasn't got up yet. He's still lying down. Why are you so afraid? Um, we're afraid because we're in the middle of a lake and there is a giant storm and the wind is beating us and we are about to get capsized, which means that we're about to drown. And when you're about to drown you're a little bit afraid. That's why we're afraid. And so we read on verse 26, then he got up, finally. <laughs> he stands. You know what that demonstrates to me? He wasn't panicked. Jesus doesn't panic. We panic. We take the knowledge that we've accumulated about the experiences that we've already had and what's going on around us and we project into the future and we panic. Our imagination gets to work, and those never-ending what-ifs get in the way. But our Creator doesn't panic. Jesus doesn't panic. Our Heavenly Father doesn't panic. He has authority over everything. And so he got up, and he rebuked, or back to that previous screen, sorry. He got up and he rebuked the wind and the waves, and it was completely calm. And immediately when Jesus spoke, everything was calm. It was gone. And right here in this moment, we see the application of this little excursion, this field trip that the disciples were on. Because the men were amazed. Of course they were. 
we would be amazed as well. And they asked, what kind of man is this that even the wind and waves obey him? And that is a great question to ask. It was a great question that they asked. It's a great question for us to ask. It's a great question if you're not sure about Christianity or maybe you used to believe and now you don't know what you believe. That is a great question to ask. What kind of man is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? You know, Peter was also, we're reading Matthew's account at the moment, but Peter was there as well. And Peter actually recounted um, his story of what happened to Mark. And he recorded it down in the book of Mark 4 verse 41. And when he writes about it, he says that they were terrified. And when you read that verse in the literal Greek, it actually, you could interpret it to say they feared a great fear. It's like he was saying they were afraid and then they were very afraid. They were afraid of the storm and then they realised who they were in the boat with. The fear of the power of what had just happened, of whose presence they were in, was greater than the fear of the storm. So their confidence in Jesus overwhelmed their fear. Their confidence in Jesus and who he was and what he was capable of overwhelmed their fear. Jesus was teaching them in this very moment that you don't have to allow fear to be the boss of you. You don't have to allow fear to overwhelm you because there's something more overwhelming, the presence of our God, the power of our God, the authority of our God. You don't have to allow fear to be the centrepiece of your life because there is somebody more capable, there is somebody more powerful than fear. And his name is Jesus. Not a bad excursion, hey? Pretty good life lesson that they're on here. But a few days later, they've gotten on with business and Jesus is like, right, I'm just going to remind them about that little lesson that we had on the boat the other day. And so while it's still fresh in his mind, he brings up the topic of fear again. So we're a few chapters on in the book of Matthew. We're now in Matthew chapter 10. And this is what Jesus says to the disciples. He says, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So he's underscoring everything that we know to be true, that there is more to us than just our physical bodies. And he's saying, don't fear, don't be afraid of anyone or anything that can kill or harm or threaten your body. No, instead, if you are going to fear something, fear the one or put the one at the centre of your life who has the authority over every realm. It's like Jesus was reminding them, don't you remember when we were in the boat and you were afraid of the wrong thing? He's saying you were fearing for your life, you were fearing for a storm, and fair enough. Like that's something that you can be afraid of but there was something more overwhelming there. Your attention, your eyes, your energy, your confidence, your focus should have been on me. It's like Jesus saying, on me, not the storm. And then he gets really personal and he continues and he says this, are not two sparrows sold for a penny. Now we go, I don't know, but they knew. In that context, they knew. They'd been down to the marketplace and they knew. It was a rhetorical question, but yeah, we agree. Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And he goes on and he says, let's not just talk about sparrows now. Let's talk about you for a minute. Even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't Be afraid because you are worth more than many sparrows. God considers you remarkably valuable, extraordinarily valuable. And he is a personal God and he knows your name and he knows what you're going through and he cares. And so even when the hard stuff is happening and even when it feels like your your prayers are not being answered, Even in the midst of a storm, a furious storm, you can trust him because he is with you and he loves you and he cares for you. And so whatever you're facing right now, whatever fear, whatever 
valley you're walking through, you can know with confidence that God sees you, that God loves you, that God knows you, and that he cares for you. You can trust him. And so at this point, the disciples are getting it. It's all starting to make sense. You can picture them sort of putting it all together. Yep, okay, we were in the storm. We were afraid, but our focus was on the wrong thing. We should have kept our focus on Jesus. And he is with us through all of the circumstances of life. But Jesus is like, I've got one more excursion for you. One more life lesson, one more application lesson around fear. And so we're still in the book of Matthew, but we're moving on a few more chapters. And we've just read about how Jesus has involved the disciples in feeding the 5,000, a story that many of us are familiar with. And so Jesus has prayed and broken five... um, I've lost the word, loaves and two fish. And he's broken them up and he's asked the disciples to distribute it. And they've done that. And they've fed over 5,000 men, women and children on top of that. And they've got 12 basketfuls of leftovers. And so if you're a disciple in this moment, you're feeling pretty good, right? Your your confidence is high. And so we're going to pick up right at the end of this story. And it says immediately, so immediately after that has happened, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat. Now, they're thinking, not again, (laughs) not another boat. We remember what happened last time we got on a boat with you. But sure enough, they get into the boat and they go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. And Jesus actually goes off and spends some time praying. And then it says, hours later, um, shortly before dawn, in fact, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. So they have been rowing literally all night against the wind and they are out to sea, well, out to the lake. And so the disciples see him walking on the lake and they were terrified. They're terrified. It's a ghost, they said. And they cried out in what? In fear. Object lesson number three, and they're still fearful. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. He has to tell them again, don't be afraid. I love you, I care for you, I am with you. Don't be afraid, as long as I'm here, there's no need to fear. And so even when there's something to be afraid of, you don't have to let boss, you don't have to let fear be the boss of you. It's another great lesson. And yet, as you continue to read all of the accounts of the disciples and Jesus, you see that the words, fear not, were easy to say and harder to live out, a lot like in our own lives. And so we're going to pick up the story again towards the end of Jesus' ministry. They're heading to Jerusalem. Um, He's got the disciples with them. It's, It's getting right to the pointy end. They're about to have the Passover meal together. And Basically, Jesus tells them about this brand new covenant that he has, this brand new covenant, which is a new relationship between God and man. And then a brand new movement. He's already talked to them about his assembly, his congregation, and how nothing is going to stop it. And then a new command. And the disciples are like, this is it. This is the moment that we have been waiting for. Our parents have shared with us about this moment where the Messiah is going to come and he's gonna reestablish the nation of Israel and the Romans are gonna get thrown out and it's all about to happen. But later that night, Jesus was arrested and the disciples panicked and then they hid and they lied And they denied and they feared. Even with all of those lessons, even with all of those excursions, they feared. And they watched Jesus be crucified. They saw him die on the cross. And they thought, it's all over. Everything that he taught us was a lie. Everything that he had claimed about himself, it's all wrong. We thought when we were on the boat with him and he calmed the waves and the wind that he was the Messiah, but he's dead. We must, it's all a lie. And they questioned themselves. But three days after that, they peered into an empty tomb and they saw their resurrected friend and they realised 
that they were back in business. There was a new covenant and a new movement and there was a new command. See, Jesus' resurrection, it punctuated everything that he had taught them about himself. And when Jesus rose from the dead, all of the things that made no sense before suddenly made sense, including the ability to fear not. And for first century believers, the resurrection was everything. It was absolutely everything. It was the source of their strength. It was the source of their boldness and their courage. And Jesus' resurrection, you know, it proved and it validated the claims that he had made about himself. It proved that he could be trusted and that he was who he said he was. And the lessons on the boat suddenly made more sense. The world was still a scary place, but they didn't need to fear because of him. They feared not. They got the lessons. They got the lesson of the storm. They got the lesson of the sparrows. Fear not, I am with you. And they came out of hiding and they faced the very men that had, you know, Willingly, they did that. They faced those very men who had arrested and flogged and crucified Jesus. And they went on to change the world. Fear not changed the world. And what changed everything was the resurrection of Jesus. And that changes everything for us too. Because when you worship a risen Lord, someone who has mastered life and conquered death, when he says, fear not, you realise I can fear not. That's what I've discovered. Not because there's nothing to be afraid of, because there is, but because I follow Jesus and I've put my eyes on him and all of my focus and all of my attention and all of my devotion is on him, the one who overwhelms any fear that I could have. Fear is part of the human experience, but none of us want to allow it to be the boss of us. And so Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, actually gives us a really practical tool to make sure that doesn't happen. And you know, Peter was there on both of those boat rides that we read about. He was there when Jesus shared about the sparrows and he panicked during Jesus' arrest. He lied when he was questioned about his relationship with Jesus. He denied who, what his relationship was, and then he went on to hide. His fear took over, but the resurrection changed things. And he later wrote a letter to Christians, first century Christians like you and I, who hadn't seen Jesus with our own eyes. But he wrote this, he said, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. Cast, throw, hurl fling, whatever verb works for you in your vernacular, do that with your cares. Fling them at Jesus. Transfer your worry, your fretting, your anxiety, your concern, your fear, because he cares for you. And Peter is writing with truth and he is writing with authority because he faced things that none of us could even begin to imagine. But he was confident that the promise that Jesus had extended to him and, his, and the disciples was the same promise that is extended to you and to I. Fear not, because I am with you. I already have a boss of me. He's mastered life. He's conquered death. And he is who he claims to be. He's worthy of all my worship and all of my trust. And he is with me. He knows me and he cares me. Cares for me. <laughs> I'm going to ask the team to come and um, just sing over us a beautiful new song. And the words of this song in the chorus are about speaking to our fear and speaking to our doubt and trusting in Jesus who is faithful, was faithful and still is faithful. And fear doesn't have to control us. Fear not. Even when there is something to be afraid of because he cares for us. And when we live like we actually believe that, when we live, you know, the power of the resurrection in our lives, we continue to change the world. We look just like those first century Christians. Can you imagine when we live that out, what that would look like in our own lives, 
in our families and in our communities. You know, as we take these few minutes with God um, as the team play for us, just individually, I want to ask you a question to ponder with, with the Lord. What would it look like for you to take Peter's advice and cast all your cares on the Lord? I want to take just a moment for you to come to him even now, even in this moment, and bring it to him. Share with him your worry and your concern, your anxiety and your fear. Share your heart because he can be trusted. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you that we can come to you and that we can cast our cares on Jesus. And even right now, Lord, perhaps for the first time, some people are gonna come to you and perhaps others the first time in a really long time. And for others of us, Lord, we're coming to you again, like we do daily. And may we experience the peace that passes all understanding, which guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And I pray for each and every one of us here today who are facing circumstances and situations and storms that cause them to feel anxious, that cause them to worry, that cause them to fear. And I pray that their confidence in You, Jesus, would overwhelm the fear that they have as they keep their eyes on You and their focus on You. May they know just how much You love them, just how much You care for them and how safe they are in Your arms. I thank You, Jesus, that because of You and in You, we can fear not. Amen. Amen.